Good afternoon. So it is Monday, just gone 10 past five. I have finished work for the day. I'm sorry I didn't come and say hi to you earlier, but it's been a bit of a busy one. How are you doing? How's your weekend? How, how have you been? I don't really know what I'm gonna be getting up to this week. I think it's, <laughs> once again, gonna be a chill one at home in the office Wednesday, Thursday. Just, you know, standard. I really need to do something to make these vlogs more interesting for you. But it is the 17th of May today. And among other things that we are allowed to do now in the UK, we're allowed to hug people from outside of our home. So people have been very excited about that. I think there are other things, other restrictions that have been lifted, but I haven't really looked into them. To be honest, a lot of it does not affect me because I pretty much work from home or I go into my office, which sticks to pretty strict guidelines on who's allowed to be in at what time. You know, I don't go out that much. I'm not a partier. I don't go to the pub. So, you know, it's not really much of a change for me. That being said, I do believe that we are allowed to go to coffee shops and stuff like that. We're allowed to sit inside now, so that's really nice. Um, so maybe, maybe, maybe at the weekend I'll go to a coffee shop. I don't know. It'll be quite nice to be able to do that. And if all goes to plan, I should be seeing Les Mis in a couple of weeks, which I'm like, please, 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 please do not mess this up. Yeah, I'm going to be seeing the stage concert of Les Mis. Do you see the joy on my face? But in terms of what I'm reading this week, I finished off Ariadne yesterday. I've actually done my May part one wrap up during my lunch break where I chatted about that. So I've now moved on to The Revolt by Clara dupont monod This is the French translated fiction, historical fiction, all about Eleanor of Aquitaine, but told from the perspective of her son, Richard the Lionheart, Richard the First of England. It's just a short little one. It's under 200 pages. So I, I don't know. I don't know what I think so far. I'm only about 10 pages in, so what can I say? And then really sticking to the medieval theme, um, on audiobook, I'm kind of partially audiobook, partially reading this, which is Chaucer, A European Life by Marion Turner. And this is very significant because this is the first book that I was given by my workplace. It's the first book that I'm showing you that was actually published by the publisher that I work for, which kind of leads me to a bit of a conundrum on what, what do I do in the situation where I'm reading books by my publisher? I don't know about the ethical conundrum that is that. <laughs> Obviously, it's a book that I'm reading and I'm planning on reading many more of the books that my publisher publishes that my publisher publishes <laughs> This is why I'm not an editor. How do I approach that in wrap ups? I don't know. It's also something I've not actually spoken to my workplace about. They might have their own ideas. I don't know what the way forward is for that. It's my workplace. Like I am a representative of those books. Like, I, you know what I mean? It's, it's weird, it's weird. And I don't know, it's either don't mention anything at all or mention things, but not put in any sort of personal opinion and keep that consistent across the board. I don't know, I don't know. What I can say about this is that I'm reading it right now and it's really interesting. All about the life of Geoffrey Chaucer, who was the author of the Canterbury Tales and I almost hit myself in the face. It's a big chunky boy, I think it's about 600 pages and basically like how his life shaped what he would go on to write. Most intriguing. But yes, that is me for today so far. I feel like there's something inherently a little bit tragic about me eating crunchy nut cereal out of the mug because I've run out of bowls and also because I wanted something sweet but didn't want chocolate or something. Didn't want to have to go out and buy it. I don't know, you tell me. Is this sad? <laughs> Okay, so it's Tuesday now and forget everything that I said about not having a very interesting week ahead of me and not really doing much this weekend because I completely forgot that it's the Eurovision this weekend. Ah! So for those of you who do not know what the Eurovision is, <laughs> Have you been living under a rock? What, what is this? The Eurovision Song Contest is a big annual, obviously didn't happen last year, um, song contest uh, with all different countries in Europe and Australia. I don't know how that works, but we go with it. And it is the most glorious theatrical campy thing that I ever see in my year. And I love it with all of my heart. And I look forward to it every single year. I was heartbroken that they couldn't do it last year. I have a great time watching it. I don't do like all the semi-final like run up to it, but I do always watch the final, which is this Saturday. And I'm so excited. It's just good fun. And like every single year, being somebody from the United Kingdom, it's always, it's always a great time because <laughs> it's kind of split down the middle as to people who love the Eurovision and people who hate the Eurovision because the UK never win. We are what's called, I think, the big five. So we donate a lot of money to the Eurovision, which guarantees us a place in the final. And to be perfectly honest, if we were not one of the big five who donate money, we would not make it to the final because the rest of Europe hates us, let's be honest. And we always end up at the wrong side of the leaderboard. And it's just really funny to me. <laughs> and it's always great fun because every single year, like me and my mum will get really into Eurovision. We'll have a great time during the performances and then the votes come in and we do horribly. <laughs> and for me personally, I think it's all just part of the fun. Like if we were on like the winning side of the leaderboard, it would not feel right. The United Kingdom not doing well at Eurovision is part of the tradition. 
it is part of the fabric of Eurovision. But every single year we get to the voting section and my mum is just outraged and she's like, why do we even bother taking part in this competition if we don't do well? We give so much money to them, we should just pull out. And I was like, no, this is not the spirit of the Eurovision. Us doing badly is, it's everything. Um, so yeah, I, have, I, I just think it's good fun. And I'm very much looking forward to it, especially after having a year of not. Oh. So much joy. Uh, so yeah, do let me know. Do you watch the Eurovision? Are you a fan? I mean, I don't understand how you could not be a fan of the Eurovision. It's just fun. It's fun. I don't know if anybody wanted another niece update, but I had a very quick WhatsApp call with her, with her and my mum. And um, she was she was being like very affectionate at the beginning, you know, give, trying to give the phone a hug. <laughs> and then halfway through the call, she was like, I'm angry with you but I love you. And uh, really, that that's just all relationships with family, I think. I think that's that in a nutshell. It's the best you can hope for. So on my lunch break, I found this. <laughs> Potentially a bit of a silly purchase, but I, I've never read it before and <laughs> wanted to. Uh, for those of you who do not know what this is, why it's significant, this is the poetry collection by T.S. Eliot that inspired Andrew Lloyd Webber's Cats, one of the weirdest shows in existence that I have ever seen, <laughs> which then spawned the uh, incredibly bizarre movie. And then also I picked up Ruth by Elizabeth Gaskell. I have read North and South, Wives and Daughters and Cranford by Elizabeth Gaskell. I feel like I've read something else by her, but I'd not read Ruth. So I hear that this one has a little bit of a twist in the middle that makes it like completely different. It's one of her really interesting plots. So yeah, looking forward to this and it's in the Oxford World Classic Edition. I've just been listening to the cast recording of Hades Town, and I've listened to it before, but I don't know, I got into my head yesterday that I really wanted to give it another listen to. And um, yeah, tearing up, tearing up. <laughs> that was a silly decision. Hello, so it is Thursday, it is the 20th of May, and today marks the one year anniversary of me posting my first video to booktube. Hey! So do I, um, I mean, ignore. The, the beautiful hair. But uh, do, I, do, I, do I look a year older? <laughs> Probably more because of this pandemic. It's age to me. Here is the slowed down reaction to a question. <laughs> Why do I do this? I really need to go to bed, but I'm just editing my Q&A video for one year on BookTube, which is going up tomorrow. And uh, I keep on sending my group chat all of my reactions to questions because I just keep on making weird faces and I, I, I don't know why it is that I do this.
great tonight. Brilliant staging, great lighting. Some wonderful vocalists and others. Well, some as flat as Holland. <coughs> We're in there. And now you are too. First song was Cypress. That was actually quite fun. That was the El Diablo one. And I just felt myself going. Yeah, I like that. That was fun. That was fun. Just had Albania. I'm not, I'm not going to lie to you. I spent the first minute of Albania's song just laughing because our commentator, Graham Norton, made a comment about how there's some noxious gases emitting from her. I just recommend that you YouTube it because it... It was great, Sorry. but great singer, but I, I don't know. I think in terms of like catchy Eurovision, it's not like rating very highly for me. Slightly prefer Cyprus. So Israel did the highest note ever sung in Eurovision, which is a B6 for context. People who don't know how high that is. Um, Christine's End of Phantom of the Opera is an E6. So that's high, that's high, that's high. high. I'm just watching Belgium and like, she, she looks like Kate Blanchett, right? Like this is what Gladriel did after Lord of the Rings. Got a whole makeover, took up a singing career, now in Eurovision. Beautiful. I just watching Rush's entry and my mum sent me a message being like, oh, she's dressed like a janitor. And it's at this moment that I realized that my mum has not yet found out about like Lucy and Yak and the whole like boiler suit dungaree trend. And I've been trying to say to her, no, 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 that's just fashion now. People do wear that. But, uh, but she wasn't, she wasn't impressed by the costuming. <laughs> Oh my God. That's my favorite so far. Also, she looked fantastic. My goodness. So Portugal were just on and they had a very different sound to what we've had before. And I was kind of into it at the beginning and then it kept on going and I was like, well, it's not Malta, is it? So we just had Serbia and Loco Loco and yeah, fun, fun. I feel like I'm just comparing everything to Malta though. I'm just like, it wasn't Malta. Raise a glass, song nine, raise a glass to Terry Wogan. Yeah, I only have water. <laughs> Okay, I don't want to sound like deeply unpatriotic, but <laughs> did we give up this year? Like, <laughs> what's going on? Oh, this isn't good. I mean, no offense to James, but. Mm. <laughs> Greece was sparkly, purple and sparkly. And like, oh, I think that might be my favorite costume so far. Okay, Switzerland get bonus points because they really worked the camera and just all of the actions and just being like... And I just, <laughs> I don't know if I'd say that it was good, but it was like peak ridiculous Eurovision. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is why I love Eurovision because it's so silly and ridiculous and I just love it. Uh, 
That was so we just had Spain. <laughs> Why did we have the massive moon? Well, I, I, I obviously I, I can't speak Spanish. So I, d I don't know really what the song's about, but like, why was there the moon? It's just kind of there. Okay. Also, we love a dramatic song that requires loads of dry ice. So yes, yes. Mwah. Just add Moldova. Apparently they say that was the longest note in Eurovision history. All right, okay. I don't know if it was. Graham says that Germany is Marmite. Okay, we're going, in, we're going back into that. What is this? What is this? What is this? What, what, what is happening? No. Germany, what is this? What am I watching? I don't understand. No. What is this? What am I watching? What is this? What is this, Germany? Why are you doing this to me? Why is somebody dressed up like that? Why? So Finland provided us with our palate cleanser of like <laughs> the obligatory, at least once a year you'll have like some sort of rock metal band that is just a change from all of like the camp pop. And <laughs> I can't say I ever love it, <laughs> but you know, refreshing, refreshing. <laughs> So we just had Bulgaria, which was like a, bit, a very slow, emotional song. Um, <laughs> I'm just feeling like after watching that, and she's literally, her only movement, she was sat down for most of it and then stood up for a bit and then did her big like notes at the end. And I feel like if I were one of the backing dancers on one of the previous songs, I'd be like, I did all of that and you just literally stand up and that's all your movement that you do, what? So just said Lithuania and yes, we love it. We love a group who know what show they're in. Another one that's like peak Eurovision, bright yellow suits, dancing, disco. Yeah, love it. The Ukraine one scares me. What parallel dimension have I stumbled into? That was weirdly hypnotic. Still a bit scary though. That was a wow. It felt like a song that could be in a film, like a really dramatic moment in a film. It was very good. just had Azerbaijan and uh, I didn't think much of the song but the costumes beautiful beautiful Ariana Grande ponytail going on it was great just finished Norway's one and which is the fallen angel song and uh, all I can think of um, is David Tennant and Michael Sheen in Good Omens and kind of wishing that I could see them performing this song. <laughs> like, tell me you wouldn't watch that. Tell me. Just tell me. The Netherlands song was basically Germany's song's message, but if that song had been good.
on the last song of the evening. No. Why is Flo Rider in this? We don't know. Why? <laughs> Boats are almost in. Let's see how far down the bottom we are. <laughs> Lol. Albania. Look at us. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Look at Amanda. <laughs> <laughs> Look at us at the bottom with the only ones with no points. Lithuania. <laughs> Ireland didn't even give us points. <laughs> to be fair, it's what we deserve. There are five countries and left to give votes, and we've still got nil fois. We are on the last country by jury, and uh, so, so proud of you. still nil fois. The 12 points from the Netherlands go to France. So it's nil fois from the jury. So now we're going to the public vote, and they go by each country, starting from the bottom and working their way up, which is quite good because it means that we're going to be first. <laughs> There's part of me that's kind of hoping that the public gave us zero votes so that we just have a zero vote. Because <laughs> that would just be really funny. <laughs> no offence to James. We start with the country that has received the lowest number of points from the professional juries, and that is the United Kingdom. My heart and breaks we'll for go James. Out country by country until we reach Switzerland, which is now in the lead with the most points given by the juries. We will begin with the country that is now in last place. That is <laughs> Just United rub the Kingdom. Salt in the wound. <laughs> and the United Kingdom gets uh. from the public <laughs> zero points. <laughs> At least they gave James like a, a, a good cheer anyway for it. Germany and Spain have also got zero points from the public vote. My, my goodness. The Netherlands as well! Oh my god! Norway? Ah, okay. <laughs> there we go. 60 points for Norway. Okay, we're going back into normal circulation. This is so tense. Nine, nine countries left to go, but it's like... Oh, what's going to happen? What we do well? It's Italy. Ready to receive from the public. Bookie's favourite. Remember how well Finland did? Three hundred and eighty points. Wow. Italy is now in first position. Gosh. Italy is in the lead. We move on to Malta. Malta has I did like Malta. Received from the public forty-seven points. <gasps> that is oh. unbelievable. Oh, I liked Malta. And at four minutes to midnight, that is Eurovision done for another year. <laughs> it's the most wonderful time of the year, aside from Christmas. And you know, that was just, that's everything I needed it to be. I mean, I just know there is going to be so much backlash against the fact that we came, not only came last, but we got zero points. But like I said before, like us getting no points is part of the fun. It is peak Eurovision spirit. I love it. And I just love this show. It's just so much fun. Good morning. So it is Sunday today and you've got me literally just out of bed. It's about 10 past eight because apparently, once again, as I've said before, it doesn't seem to matter what time I go to bed. Uh, since I started working full time, I can't seem to sleep any later than like eight o'clock. But I don't feel tired, which is good. But I realised that I hadn't really given you much of an update on the actual reading. I probably like showed clips of myself reading, but not actually what I was thinking about the books. But you know what? This week hasn't been too bad for reading. So first off, at the beginning of the week, you'll see I was reading The Revolt by Clara Dupont Menot, which was the story of Eleanor Facatain's life, but told from the perspective of Richard the Lionheart, her son. It's just a short little thing. Um, and 
yeah, I thought this was okay. I probably don't want to say too much about these now. I'll probably go more in depth in my wrap up. Final feelings about this is that it was it was doing okay. It did at points feel a bit detached, which I was trying to work out whether that was intentional or not in terms of the emotions. But then partway through, it does something that I wasn't too keen on, which is that it swapped the perspective from Richard over to Eleanor of Aquitaine. And I was like, because I felt like the fun, the interest, the intrigue of this book is the fact that Eleanor seems like a mystery to Richard. And so when you jump perspectives, that you just break that entirely. I didn't feel like it was necessary at all. So yeah, um, I ended up being a little disappointed with that. And then I found this, uh, T.S. Eliot's Old Possum's Book of Practical Cats, which is the book that Cats the musical was based on. And yeah, this is just fun. Obviously, I knew these poems because of knowing the musical. I can definitely see why Andrew Lloyd Webber like loved this as a child. Why he was inspired to then adapt it into one of the weirdest shows that I've ever seen. Less clear on, but you know, I, I yeah. And then another short little read that I got to this week was Alan Bennett's The Uncommon Reader. Another thing that I found this week in a charity shop. I need to stop going into charity shops. They're just right outside my workplace. I can't help it. But this was a book that I had seen other people saying how fantastic it was and was just so surprised to see it in a charity shop. So when I saw it, I had to grab it. And yeah, this is just a little novella about uh, a scenario in which the Queen, we know it's the Queen of England, but it's not really the Queen as we know her, stumbles into a library one day, picks up a couple of books and then ends up absolutely obsessed with reading to the detriment of all of her other duties and kind of what would be the turnout of that. It's very satirical, it's really funny and just like I say, a short little thing. It was delightful. Read it in like the space of an afternoon. I then amazingly ended up finishing off Chaucer by Marion Turner. Once again, this is a book that my work publishes. And this is basically, you know, partly a biography of Chaucer's life. It is a biography of Chaucer's life, but it's also giving you this wider context of interactions with the rest of Europe, how we can see Chaucer's travels through Europe and his relationship with the English court as well, how that influenced what he wrote. Medieval history. <laughs> So those are the books that I have managed to finish this week. And in terms of what I'm part way for at the moment, I am about 100 pages into The Dictionary of Lost Words by Pip Williams. This has been really interesting to read because it is set in Oxford, as I've said. And so I'm getting to moments where she's mentioning street names, place names, which, you know, I'm not fully aware of yet because I've only been here a couple of months. But she mentions the Banbury Road a billion times in Jericho. And I do know the Banbury Road. It's a massive, massive long road leading you down to Oxford. So there's part of me that's really, really tempted to do an individual review of this and then maybe even try and get my camera out and like take you down like the different roads. It's a really interesting book so far and there are a lot of different themes that I'm picking up from this, which always bodes well when it comes to individual reviews. I feel like I've not had a book recently where lots of different things have jumped out and that's that, that is basically what tends to separate books that I do do individual reviews on and ones that I don't, is that individual book reviews tend to happen when I just have too much to say about a book. There are so many different things that I could talk about in regards to a book. And I'm hoping that this kind of keeps up that pace and that interest for me. Because yeah, like I say so far, I don't know if this is going to be a favourite book, but there are so many different things that are jumping out about it for me. And then in terms of audiobooks that I'm listening to at the moment, I am listening to Swan Song by Kaylee Greenberg. Jeff Gott. This is a book that is chronicling Truman Capote and his collection of women, these very intense friendships that he had with all of these like society ladies and how he got very, very close to them, extracted lots of secrets from them. And then one day like published this big sensationalist article about them. Some of whom he mentioned by name, some of whom like it was very clear who it was, even though it was very thinly veiled. And yeah, it's a very interesting character portrait of Truman Capote. I don't know if I would say that I'm enjoying it. It's intriguing. So yes, those are all of the books that my eyeballs have touched. <laughs> what? That I have interacted with this week. Today should be quite a quiet in the house day. I need to edit a video. I need to clean the house. And I'm also talking to Claudia at Spinster's Library today. She'd put out a call on Twitter about interviewing different booktubers about their relationships to like views and numbers and analytics basically on booktube. So I'm going to get to chat to Claudia, which is really exciting. Um, but yeah, I basically need to get ready, eat some food, clean the house, film a video, interview. 
I don't know if I'm gonna get all that done actually. <laughs> I'd also quite like to have a bit of time to read. And I'm watching Call the Midwife with my mum. Me and my mum like to have Facebook Messenger up whilst we watch Call the Midwife and basically react to it together. It's a nice little tradition. I'm gonna be very very sad when the Call the Midwife finishes for this season because Gogglebox has just finished which is the other show that me and my mum like to watch together, watch together. And I think we've only got a couple more episodes of Call the Midwife to go so. Meh. But anyway, on with my Sunday. Hello, hello. So I've just gotten off from my chat with Claudia, who was so lovely. We couldn't chat too, too much because she had other people to talk to. But Claudia, if you're watching this, you are a delight. Let's do it again sometime. And I did manage to clean a bit of the house, which is good. Still got a little bits and pieces left to do. Gotta clean the bathroom. <laughs> But I'm very much like woman on a mission when I start cleaning the house. I'm like, I've got to get everything done. But first, I'm going to get myself a cup of tea and I'm going to have some food. I've also made the executive decision that a video is not coming out today because I've got my weekly reading vlog, which currently as it stands, the, the, the vlog that you are currently watching, uh, in raw footage, it is over an hour long because of all of my Eurovision digressions. I regret nothing, except that's going to take a while to edit. So you will have seen that there was no Sunday video this week. We're just gonna be at peace with that, but tea time. I've cleaned the house and I filmed a video today. I feel so accomplished. 